everyone. My name is Jessa Phillips. I will be your virtual host for this evening's event. The Museum of Nature and Science is so pleased to be partnering with the Nature Conservancy of Colorado for yet another great virtual event. Um, tonight's event is Back from the Brink, Saved from uh, Extinction. Um, so tonight we were hoping to show you the entire film Unfortunately, we're having some technical, technical difficulties. We're gonna show the trailer for the film, have a presentation by Chris Pegg Pegg from the Nature Conservancy, take some Q&A, and then we're hoping to have the film queued up for you by then. Um, however, if we don't have it by then, we're gonna contact everyone after this evening and find a way, hopefully for you all to see the film in its entirety. We're excited for you all to see it. Um, as we get started, I'd like to read the Denver Museum of Nature and Science land acknowledgement statement. The Denver Museum respectfully acknowledges that the land that we are on today is the traditional homeland of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute Nations people. We also acknowledge that the state of Colorado includes the traditional and ancestral lands of 28 tribal nations who now live in the American Southwest, the Great Plains, and the Rocky Mountain region. As you watch tonight's presentation, um, please send us a chat. The chat um, just goes to hosts and panelists, but we are definitely watching it and we wanna know all of your questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gabriela Chavarria, the Vice President of the Science Division here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So welcome, thank you for being with us tonight, Dr. Chavarria. Great, thank you, Jessa, and welcome everybody. Good evening. Uh, the museum and the Nature Conservancy have this incredible partnership, which I'm very proud of, not only because I'm a member of the museum, but also because I'm a trustee in the Colorado office of the Nature Conservancy, which has been a really highlight during this pandemic. And tonight we're, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to fix these little technical difficulties, but you will be able to see the film tonight or another time. But regardless of that, uh, I think we have a very special program uh, with you tonight. And first of all, you know, I wanted to uh, talk about Chris Peck, who I am just very honored that I'm, you know, I'm the one that gets to, to introduce him tonight. Uh, because you probably don't know this, but uh, Chris, um, who has worked who has worked for, um, for the Conservancy since March of 1992, is about to retire, yes, at the end of October. And Chris' work has literally shaped conservation in Colorado. And his expertise as a senior conservation ecologist, and especially his knowledge on grasslands and ecosystems, has really enabled large scale conservation work, not only here in Colorado, but across the world. Uh, particularly, he's done a lot of work. He did a lot of work in Mongolia and Argentina. And those of us who know him also know that he has a fondness for all species. And he's just the perfect speaker for tonight's film uh, because he likes them large, he loves the small, he loves them furry or slimy, and, and he has been really a mainstay for the last 10 years at our joint events with the, with the museum and the conservancy. Uh, always bringing science and conservation to life uh, for so many of us. And also, you know, bringing to us this incredible, you know, uh, curiosity and sharing the best stories because he does have the best stories. So I know I speak for all of us when I say that we wish him well on his next adventures. And on behalf of the museum, Chris, and I know the Conservancy membership and everybody that has run uh, into your life through all your career, uh, you know, we wanna wish you well on your next adventures. And we wanna thank you uh, for all of your work that you have done in Colorado and beyond. So I'll pass it on to you, Chris. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that, that was a, a generous uh, introduction to be sure. And 
um, you know, uh, retiring is, I've never done it before, so I don't know how to do it. And so I guess I'll just uh, quit going to all the meetings and things and just keep doing conservation work. That's, that's what I love. And I just think that the, the life on this planet is an amazing, uh, just by itself. And then as an ecological service for people, it's just unbelievable. And so um, my, my goal will be to continue exploring, um, sharing, and doing whatever I can do to influence and make our conservation work do better. And uh, I will say this, that, uh, you know, different kind of partnerships throughout uh, my career, and I've just loved the time, uh, not enough time, but to spend with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Not every uh, institution or every uh, city has that luxury. And not only is it a museum, but it's also uh, the type of museum which actually gets out in the field, collects information, stores that information and makes it readily available to all of us as we want to take a look at it and learn from it. So thank you very much, Gabby, for that introduction. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, you, you won't get rid of me by retiring. I'm, I'll be around. All right. Chris, Chris, remember we're showing the video first, the trailer. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. it's not too late to save them. This is the story of three remarkable successes of animals brought back from the brink of extinction. Off the coast of California, the tiny Channel Island fox. In the mountains of southwestern China, the Yunnan golden monkey. And on tropical Christmas Island, the famous red crab. Now experience the powerful true story of how we came together to save these animals and their habitats. Join us for a journey of discovery, innovation, and success. from the brink, saved from extinction. With narration by Claire Danes in IMAX and giant screen cinemas. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, the, the trailer is exciting, exciting enough for me when I happened to, to view it a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> But, I, but I've got to make this comment first. I, I uh, those monkeys, those golden monkeys. Uh, I know as a scientist, I'm not supposed to use words like cute, but wow, they're they're pretty cute. And I do wonder if they got some kind of uh, you know uh, facial treatments to those lips. They're just so beautiful and and uh, bulging and shiny like that. So it's pretty amazing. So. Uh, but it's a very, very exciting time when we can think in this, uh, as we're starting to talk about the sixth extinction and climate change driving species to the brink, uh, which this, this, uh, talk, or this uh, presentation and movie will talk about in greater detail. So um, let's talk for a minute though about, you know, the past, the present and future of conservation efforts in this context. And so what I'll do first is I'll just briefly mention a couple of things about, uh, you know, the two of the species that show up in the film, uh, making just a couple of quick comments. And then I want to talk about species that have been at the brink or might be in the brink. And so I want to talk a little bit about the past. Um, the current situation, and then what are we going to do about all this? And is there really hope, or are we in a really bad situation and have to think of the, the sixth extinction as our final step in, in a process we've been starting for thousands of years? So, but first, uh, if you do know the Nature Conservancy, um, you know that we are a worldwide organization. We are 
active in 50 states and 25 or so extra countries, sometimes the boundaries of countries and programs in some of the most uh, dynamic areas switch around. And so we may or may not be active uh, at any particular time, but we do have offices right now in 74 uh, country programs around the world. And so that is uh, pretty exciting uh, when you think about the mission here, which is protecting the lands and waters on which all life depends. Now, I also want to make this really clear that the Nature Conservancy works with a, an amazing array of partners. And again, I just want to say how excited we are to be doing this and other activities um, with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So just as you probably we're hoping and, and we understand that um, there's at least a yellow light now instead of a red light on the film showing up. So we're really looking forward to seeing that. But again, just really quickly on the Yunnan Golden Monkey as Conservancy uh, worked and built a large program in China um, in the last 20 years. China did not have a solid conservation program, but they were very hungry to do that. And so among the first things was just to find out what species needed the most attention. And of course, one everybody thinks about right, right uh, out front is the panda. And that's certainly one of those cases, but in that far Southwest corner, of China, the Yunnan golden monkey is another one. And it has been, a, and I'm not gonna, not gonna cut into what the film's gonna say, but I'll just say this, that sometimes the success that we talk about will not seem so grand, but it is so remarkable when we can think that a species that really was on the brink of extinction now either has a really good fighting chance or we can say it's actually been saved. And that's the species. There are somewhere between two and 3,000 individuals left in the wild from a, from a time when there were many thousands more. It's a relatively small area that they dwell in. And among the threats are poaching. There's still in these remote areas, people who just cherish the old way and the old foods. And so that's a real problem. There are only about 1000 mature individuals left in a bunch of different populations. And so while we might say we've saved them and that's true, there's a, there's a national park, there's all kinds of programs, but there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure. And I think that's an important thing. We're going to be, uh, good stewards if we do all the right things of all of our wildlife into the future and stopping extinction is step one. And the Channel Island Fox, I was just talking with the former director of the, the uh, California Nature Conservancy uh, yesterday about this species and how remarkable it is. And again, I'm not going to cut into the program, but it's, uh, it's a true story of both First of all, making sure that the habitat is protected, finding out what is not working very well in that habitat. And then no matter what it is with the commitment of making sure that all species thrive, figure out how you're gonna fix it, not whether you're gonna fix it. We almost never have to take that. We, at least we don't believe it and we don't want to, but it's how are you gonna fix it? I, I leave that to the story because it, it's absolutely amazing the level of effort and love that went into this project. So for the rest of this, uh, let me talk a little bit about the past. And we sometimes we look at the world and it's, it, it, we, we see today something and we think that's the way it's been. Uh, or, or we think that this is the current state is the optimal state. And I think one of the things we have to remember when we talk about species being on the brink is if we look back into the past, we can see that what we had during this time was the colonization of an entire continent. And all of the natural resources were what was being used to supply all the people that were doing that. And so we had a tremendous amount of taking of all those natural resources. And it wasn't until the late 1800s when that started to turn around. People started seeing at that time that the resources were to being, being depleted. And I'll give you quick three cases here 
of how that has happened in the last 100, 120 or so years. Um, the first case, I'll, I'll just start with the bison. It's a very familiar story to most people, but the bison uh, roamed something in the continent of 30 million individuals. And while we hear about all those individuals in the Great Plains and the Great Migrations, which are, are true, uh, and, and certainly the magnificent amount of, uh, of uh, number of wildlife species that were there, um, the species actually occurred all the way from the western, I mean, the eastern edge of California to Virginia, um, to the northern edge of Florida, all the way up into the Great Lakes region, and then over to Alaska and down to Mexico. So it was a very widespread species, and not all of the bison moved in those big giant herds. But it was also an obvious species to be used as the meat products for all the people who were doing the mining, the exploration, the building towns, converting to farmland and all that. And so, as you uh, probably already know, by the late uh, 1800s, they were reduced down to fewer than a thousand individuals. And what has happened since is that um, people have actually paid attention. And a few individuals were taken to the Bronx Zoo and a few places they were saved like Yellowstone and uh, Wood Park in, in Canada. And now there are about 400,000 bison in North America, most of which are domesticated or run as livestock. But there are only 25,000 bison that are considered bison living as bison. In other words, they have enough care, enough of the characteristics of they can roam fairly large areas. They get to move freely when they want. Their genetics are pretty good uh, and not always hybridized. So there's still a lot of work to be done with the bison to get some of them in places. Uh, in Colorado, we're lucky to have a few of those. And the Nature Conservancy was fortunate to get a bison herd when we protected the Medino Zapata Ranch next to the Great Sand Dunes. And that herd, we're trying to do all that we can to manage that herd as a conservation herd. Now, another example that's uh, current is the Canadian lynx. And the Canadian lynx was always an uncommon species, but instead of being used as a resource for food or for sport, this animal had a price on its fur and was trapped out. And it, by the 1970s, the last individual was actually trapped in Colorado. Uh, so about the time the Endangered Species Act came in, uh, there were discussions about it becoming an endangered species. It's a remarkable beast. I mean, look at the size of that foot. Now, of course, it's closer to the camera, but even when you see one anywhere in the wild, that foot is much disproportionately large compared to the body of that. And of course, that's the snowshoes uh, that they need. Now there's also, um, you know, so when these things were trapped out, there was a distinctly concentrated effort to prevent the Fish and Wildlife Service from listing them in the state. And this is where sometimes the competition between the state and the feds is a good thing. We get this tension where all of a sudden there's a lot of action in the state. And so Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service to bring in some links from Canada mostly and bring them down here and restore them. And today there are about uh, you know, somewhere between 50 and 250. It's hard to count links, so that's why those numbers are there. Uh, but they are reproducing and they're considered a tentative success right now. And then finally, the, another really big one, and sometimes we don't think about it because today this species, the elk, is really common. Um, it, it's uh, not only that, it's still expanding its range. But that wasn't always the case. And to provide meat for the meat markets, both the shipping it out to the eastern cities and, and uh, for the miners and, and uh, loggers and other farmers and everybody who was living in Colorado, the elk were all but extinct at one point in time. They were hunted down to where there are estimated to be fewer than a thousand individual elk in the state. And uh, as wildlife philosophies changed and as the um, people started trying to figure out how are we gonna get those back. There was a concentrated effort uh, with the realization that they had depleted these to where the elk were then being moved around in the state to be restocked, some brought in from other states. 
And now the ilk herd is approximately 375,000 or so. And that's a remarkable success. And we wanna recognize that. There are a lot of problems along the way. And even today, we're challenged with the numbers in some places, but they're a heavily managed species and they are moving out east on the Great Plains into Oklahoma and into Kansas, and they're moving across. They're now showing up in the Nebraska Sand Hills. So it's a great story that we can tell. My apologies for that. Um, the digital media is a tough thing for me in general, and when it's this big with so many illustrations, uh, it's tough. So uh, here we go with one of the key elements, so, so managing species and getting their populations up is one strategy that's absolutely critical when they're on the brink. We might be getting them lost, but there's also the nature of the habitat is protected. And this map really illustrates that it was only in the 1970s that private land protection for conservation was really getting a good start in the Western US, especially in Colorado. But what's really critical to know is that all of that depletion of wildlife and all those depletion of timber and, and other resources in the West alarmed a lot of people from the ecological society um, to natural resource managers to wilderness people like John Muir. And so the greenish colors and some of the other colors you see on this map in the 1970s is really what the origins in the late 1800s of the National Forest Service. And we are so grateful to them for doing that. But in the 70s, there were also three easements at that particular point in time. And that was one of the first moves in this part of the world to use easements as a conservation strategy because easements were developed in the late 1800s. So this is pretty remarkable. And by the way, all of these easements were donated easements by people who really cared. So, that's a picture, a little bit of a peek into the past. So now let's look at the present and talk a little bit about the status. And there we get some very interesting information. Um, just as an example, if, if we look at what's happened between uh, the, the historical past and today, there are a few species and some examples here that are actually thriving pretty much with humans. And that's the skunk, the raccoon, the coyote, red fox, and there are other species. These species have uh, become quite accustomed to humans and they are thriving, but the majority of species have lost a lot of habitat. And this diagram actually shows that part of their range, um, you know, from something like the pine marten having lost 20% approximately of its range to the black-footed ferret, which is all but extinct. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So this is pointing out that while we can look at animals in a population sense by the number of animals, when we look at their historic ranges and see what has been lost, we have to be very thoughtful about that and cognizant of that and make sure that now we're paying attention to the remaining habitat. And so that brings me then to um, what does the protected lands look like today in comparison to that other map? And you'll notice that by this time, the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management is playing a larger role. There are national parks that are playing a role, but then notice the private lands conservation and some of the state and, and uh, local uh, government uh, conservation as well. And there's a tremendous amount of protection that's gone on. And in particular, notice that in the Great Plains, because in the Great Plains in that earlier slide, it took the Dust Bowl for there to be any action of conservation or protection in land. And that was done only through when the land had become so eroded and people couldn't afford it. And they just basically, the government bought it from them. And that created the Comanche and, and uh, National Grasslands uh, and the Pawnee National Grasslands, relatively small areas. But now there's been a lot of activity in the Great Plains. And so Great Plains species are being considered as a part of this to make sure that they don't go extinct as well. And just a couple of examples from the state that are uh, of interest. And yes, this looks just like yet another mouse, but it's not another mouse. It actually um, has a body length of about nine inches when you consider the tail. The tail is twice as long as the body, 
uh, it jumps and it needs to use that tail to keep from flipping over. It's a counterbalance. Uh, it also hibernates for seven, sometimes eight months in the year. So it's a pretty strange mouse in that sense. It was named in the late 1800s. And since that time though, the reason that this mouse is of conservation concern, it's the Prebles meadow jumping mouse, is it's only found in the front range stream corridors from Colorado Springs to just north of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And that species um, has, of course, that habitat was being intensively used as the towns and cities developed in the Front Range. Lots of grazing, clearing for more uh, growing, uh, more crops and hay, uh, and some pollution from the mining and other uh, attributes that reduce this species, we think that it's lost about 80% of its habitat in, in that small range. The, uh, the, it was listed in the, uh, as a threatened species uh, in the late 1990s, and it was then used as a species to help bring conservation efforts together with all of the communities on the front range. And so at this point in time, it's considered stable. Uh, under its listing status, uh, still not recovered, and that is yet to come. And then another story that's a pretty remarkable one, to me, it's one of the most remarkable of all the North American stories is the black-footed ferret. And most of you may know this, the black-footed ferret feeds almost exclusively on prairie dogs. Well, prairie dogs weren't exactly the love of everybody's life uh, that was exploring uh, how to use the West when we came out here. And so black-footed ferrets had the challenge of one, their food source uh, was purposefully being eradicated. Uh, some estimates are that somewhere between 90 and 98% of all the prairie dogs that used to live out in the Great Plains uh, were eradicated. And then there's also diseases, and the diseases not only are for the prairie dogs, which can be devastating to a colony and therefore anything that needs to be feeding on it, but also uh, diseases that came from Europe on uh, our pets like cat and dog distemper and uh, other diseases that are uh, devastating. But the story is just fantastic. This was thought to be extinct when the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973, and somebody found 17 individuals on one ranch up near Matitsi, Wyoming. And that was a pretty remarkable thing. While there was a little bit of jostling about who was going to take the lead on this, the Fish and Wildlife Service eventually captured all individuals working closely with Wyoming, did a captive breeding program. And now there are about 600 individuals of black-footed ferrets, about half in the wild and about half in captivity. And it was pretty remarkable. This is a connection directly with our conservation easements. A remarkable man uh, down in near Pueblo, uh, Gary Walker, has put easements on his property and he's letting the prairie dogs go. And, and he decided, well, if black-footed ferrets need to eat prairie dogs, that's not necessarily bad for my range either. So I want to have them on the property. And so he released them on that conservation easement. They are, um, you know, they are reproducing. They're struggling uh, with the droughts and things. We always have that. And we're always worried about disease and how to treat that. But it's a remarkable story that thought to be extinct. And now, uh, at least in captivity, we think we know how to keep it alive. And then in the wild, there's efforts to restore them in dozens of places every year. Well, that's kind of some stories about things that happened in the past, and some of them are in, uh, better stories than others. But let's real quickly um, look at um, let, let's look at the future now. So, so we've what we've got is I showed you the map of a lot of species have uh, reduced ranges. Um, and uh, by, by the way, I, I, sh I should have mentioned this, if you want to go see some black-footed ferrets, there is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Breeding Center um, up at, uh, north of Fort Collins. There is a, a small colony of them also at the Rocky Mountain um, National Wildlife Refuge, and of course, um, our partner at, at, at the uh, the zoo at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo has some. So those are excellent opportunities. They're pretty fascinating animals. Um, you, you'll know, if you remember in that picture, I actually have to go back and show that, I think, or maybe I'm done. 
uh, anyway, that that picture of uh, the the young lady who was releasing that uh, that black footed ferret was wearing a heavy glove, and I forgot to mention that that they look cute. Um, you don't want to touch one. Uh, they make growling noises to warn you, and then they will readily attack. They're not that kind of fuzzy, cute, warm creatures. All right, let's see. My apologies, there we go. Okay, so um, to look into the future, it might be useful to look at this uh, chart of just some, and this, some species, and I, I'm not gonna spend but a second on this, but the Colorado Natural Heritage Program and Colorado Parks and Wildlife are the two entities that really maintain the strongest sets of data on the status of uh, our, our biodiversity. And they also have developed jointly a state wildlife action plan, which is to say what species are the most at risk, which ones do we need to pay attention to the most, and what habitats do they need to be saved in. So I compiled this table and you can see that these are in what's called tier one, and that's the highest priority at risk species of plants, insects, fish, mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, 182. Not all of those are extremely rare, but they're all showing significant declines. And we've also already heard in the last year that almost 3 billion birds have been lost from the world's bird population or North America's bird population in the last few years. That's a remarkable thing that should concern us all. There are also a big decrease in the number of insects flying over, um, you know, it's just flying over the air where all our birds, the swallows and the nighthawks and things are eating. There are some signs that we can't just talk about extinction. We need to be thinking about preventing extinction. And that's really what this future is about. And it's a relatively simple planning thing. This could be in almost any, any place in the world, any business. Where do we want to be? We want to be where all species thrive. And then how are we going to get there? And that's, of course, is, uh, I've, that's so simple, simple, uh, simple that it's hard to even imagine what we're talking about here. But what we have done through the science is an amazing uh, bunch of scientists working on this, including in, in the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that. The components of conservation success. First of all, we want to make sure that where we know biodiversity is rich, important, rare species occur, that needs to be saved and its habitat managed right. Second of all, because we're talking about a changing world, resiliency is something we really want to focus on. In other words, we want to have landscapes and places where there's a great diversity of habitat. And species can then, if they need to find refuge in a smaller, like more of an area that has more moisture or more of a north facing or a special kind of a, a geology, these diverse places will be able to provide uh, them a, res a reserve, a place where they can hide, a place where they can wait out until better conditions occur. And then the third piece is about connect landscapes and not just corridors, but whole landscapes where the biodiversity, where, where the, the world's climate seems to be going crazy, they can find a way to move as they need to uh, for the ones that do need to move. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So the Nature Conservancy led with hundreds of scientists across North America an effort to identify where and how big uh, are some of the places that are most important. In other words, if we're going to be successful at conserving the full suite of natural diversity in the natural communities, the habitats that they live in, can we find those? And you can see the multiple sources used here, but here is a map of what in North America and Mexico has been identified as critical for saving for biological reasons. So that's the first category is recognized areas of biological importance. And then that second characteristic that I was talking about, the resilience based on different soils and making sure that all the soils are available, the geology, the topography, microclimates, and of course, having to consider human modification because that's often a, a real negative factor. 
Here's a map that shows that in the green, basically it's yellow is average. In other words, uh, we don't think that, that, that that's anything special, but it's not bad. And then all of the greener colors, the darker green is the higher levels of resi excuse me, resilience. And then the brownish levels are below average. So you can see a pattern in here. And if you can look on the um, right there, I believe if you can see my cursor, but you can see that a lot of green over in that part of the state and a lot of brown in the Eastern part where there's a lot of agricultural activity going on. So that map then shows us the most resilient areas. So we have important areas and we have resilient areas that will provide some diversity for species over time. And then I love this quote by Jim Williams out of Montana. He says, nature is a nomad. And it's one of the embarrassing things for me is to not have thought more about this. As we talked to the Nature Conservancy has done a wonderful job of saving places. Many other organizations are saving places. We have wildlife refuges and things. But nature has always moved and it will always move. Most familiar are things like these pronghorn, which will migrate uh, hundreds of miles up in Wyoming and probably used to do similar things here. Uh, but even more probably critical is, is over time, nature has always moved. And it has moved across whole continents, continents have moved beneath and uh, caused diversity to change. So the connectivity part of the work is really critical as we think about the climate shifting that's going on right now. And this map is showing a model that was done by Brad McRae, uh, a former TNC scientist. He, he actually, he's passed away unexpectedly, but he, he, um, he was an engineer who got really fascinated with conservation. And so he used engineering models to create this, which is um, mammals, birds, and amphibians, and how under climate we would predict where they would need to move if climate warms as much as it possibly could. And this is a pretty remarkable thing, but it also then provides us a tool for conservation design. And if you look on the um, approximately where Colorado is, there is a Great Plains contingent for animals moving through that Eastern Great Plains. There is also uh, right up the Rocky Mountain front of the front range. And then there's another one right out in the Western edge that combines with one running to Utah. Really important areas. So we can put that on a map and combined with the other two layers. So again, resilience and connectivity. And what we get is the bluer the areas, the more, uh, let's see, it, it's both resilient and there's a lot of flow going on. In other words, it's going to be climate important. The brown ones are connected and, uh, you know, concentrated flows. They're narrower areas that might be, say, along certain river corridors and things. But the point here is that we now have a way of looking at any region that we've been doing these studies for. We know what's important. We know the resilient areas and we know how connectivity uh, needs to work in here, at least according to the models. That is a hugely powerful tool. But let's take it now and make it a little more uh, personal for those of us who are in Colorado and look at these uh, state maps. So there's another one here. We, we have recognized biodiversity. These are the maps that are designed or taken from state wildlife action plans, eco-regional plans, species management plans, and say, these are the important areas. We need to protect those. And we also can look at resilience. And you can see that there are areas that are not very uh, that are not highly resilient, but then there's a lot of green and dark green. That is in the southeastern corner of the state, the southeastern prairie has tremendous uh, resilience down in there. And of course, in the mountains with all the variability and the geology and the slopes and the aspects, the same thing. So we can look at where resilience occurs. And then we can also take those flow maps and those the climate flows and the connectivity, and we can actually look at this. And the darker blues are, are really critical for both kinds of movement. In other words, long distance movement over time and the paler blues are about that particular area has a lot of 
what we call permeability. Species that live there can move around within that landscape. So these connected landscapes are hugely powerful. And then we finally, we combine all this together and we get a map, which I like to call a map of hope because it's really about conservation success. And so that is a map of where we really need to pay particular attention. There will be some restoration to connect some of the dots and there'll be a lot of protection. And then of course it has to be managed well. But here's the real key. If you remember this map of Colorado's protected lands, we wanna know, I mean, that's a huge, that, that map, I'll go back and show it one more time. That is a huge task to think about assuring that conservation uh, can occur over that large of an area. But then this map, when you look at it, um, we've done the calculations and approximately 68% of that resilient connected lands of high biodiversity importance is already conserved today. So that gives me one, it gives me a great deal of hope. And the other one is, as things are changing more and more rapidly, it means we've got to bear down. We've got to get on this. Um, so, there. So we, we went through some examples. I just mentioned a couple of things about uh, the, the, uh, the film and a couple of the species there. Um, but what's really critical now is that I wanna make sure that I've, I've been really clear about this, but nature is resilient if we give it a chance. And those species in the film that you're gonna see um, are, are cases in point. The elk population down to a thousand individuals. And yet when they were given the opportunity, they came back and are now one of the more common species in this part of the world and a great economic contributor to Colorado. And there are many other cases like this. And there are, there are some that are still challenging like the bison, how something that moved over such a large area and is such a large animal, how do you deal with that? But if we can find a way to give it a chance, it's resilient and more times than not, we find out that they come back with gusto. The second point, key point here is that science gives us powerful tools. With satellite imagery looking all over, with the amount of data that are collected in museums like the Denver Museum and, and by scientists like the Natural Heritage Program and the Nature Conservancy and, and many other, including amateur naturalists out there, we could pull those data now into maps in ways that we never could and create models that do things like show those climate flow models. So we have a really powerful set of tools and there, there is uh, you know, using those now to help us be efficient and effective at conservation. And finally, the urgency and importance of this, I mean, the importance of it is that species are just remarkable on their own, but we, we're, we have the responsibility to, and the decision-making authority to decide what most species in the world, how they fare. But the climate crisis has made it even more urgent, not just for them, but for us. And so hopefully we can do this uh, together and have the outcome be that all life thrives. But the time to act is right now. And we've never seen it more than with all the um, weather and climate effects of this year. So we all play a role. We all have something to do, and so, so supporting organizations like the Nature Conservancy, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and other uh, organizations that are learning, sharing, educating, and actually doing the conservation on the ground, uh, we can support those organizations, and we can find out what they're doing and, and, and make sure that that helps to inspire us and give us hope. Um, there are activities, specific ones, all over uh, the state, and in particular, the Nature Conservancy um, on the 25th of September. You can volunteer with the Nature Conservancy to help clean and restore Globeville Landing Park. And uh, while cleaning and restoring uh, is, is in its own right a worthy task, we're finding out more and more in the world how the things that we need to clean up and the, the places we need to restore are having a deleterious effect on the wildlife and the plants that live there. And so it is a conservation act in two different ways. And then finally, 
Um, it really is important that we make our vo voice heard. In the offices of legislators, they all have telephone numbers and email addresses that you can contact them. Nothing better than the voice and with your consumer dollars. And that's really important. And I think uh, I'll mention just again, the legislators. I've, I've heard from both of our senators over the last 10 years uh, that it's always better if you call the office and try to talk with somebody directly there. That's the most direct way. And the long lasting way is through the ballot box. So, um, so I wanna thank you. Um, for sharing your time with us tonight. I hope that we have been able to show one, some cases where we have had success in conservation, or at least we're in the stages where success is much more likely now, uh, and especially important at a time when we often hear such bad news. Uh, but, at, but at the same time, um, you know, the future is not necessarily dark and we can do it. We've done 68% in this state of the conservation protection that needs to be done to fulfill that model that says we can have life thriving alongside of humans and our, our ability to dwell in the land. So that's going to be a really important thing for us to have that hope but also time is getting shorter and the sixth mass extinction is being, especially in other parts of the world, is on its way. And we will need to be very thoughtful and careful, but diligent in making sure that that other 45%, at least in Colorado, is taken care of. So I wanna thank you so much for your time. I hope this has been a meaningful experience and a hopeful one. Any questions? So Chris, we have great news. The film is available. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna have folks view the film and then open it up for questions because I think the film is gonna spark questions for a lot of folks. Those are some really inspiring stories, Chris. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions here from the audience. Um, I'm going to start with some questions about the Channel Island project that the Nature Conservancy was a part of. Um, I saw they answered some folks in the chat, but just so the whole audience can hear. Why didn't the gold eagles return to the Channel Islands? Yeah, that's, it's a great question, and it's one that's, uh, you know, interesting in biogeography, um, but Golden eagles don't generally spend a lot of time flying over the ocean. And so these islands are a long way. I can't remember exactly how many miles from the coastline where the golden eagles would, uh, while having to, um, you know, wrestle with the bald eagles there, at least uh, they would have to fly over that. And that's not a typical thing, but it does, it obviously did happen on occasion. And uh, when there were no bald eagles on the island to uh, make sure and push away the golden eagles, the, the bald eagles are pretty much bullies about golden eagles. Uh, so I think that it's just a case of the, the golden eagles, um, you know, did not very often fly out over that area. And so they didn't come back and repopulate. I do know that from some of my colleagues there, they said they took these eagles and didn't release them on the coast. They took them way back into California, into the higher country. So I hopefully, hopefully that's a good enough explanation. I don't, I'm not totally sure, but even here in Colorado on prairie dog towns in the winter, when the bald eagles come in, um, yeah, we've seen uh, golden eagles kill prairie dogs and then the bald eagles come and run them off. So they won't tolerate a golden eagle within their territory. Thank you. And a follow up to that, were the bald eagles raised there on the island or were they released as adults and were any nesting pairs formed? My understanding is that the initial part was that the, the eagles were brought in from breeding colonies from outside until they uh, had enough of them that were living on the island to where they created their own pairs and then started breeding. Um, and I think this is a really great question. Um, how do we know when it's the right decision when we try to eradicate an invasive species in favor of a native species? That's a pretty uh, big one to answer. Yeah, 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 I was gonna say, how about Jess, you answer that one. 
Um, I'll pass it to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, th these are tough and ethical decisions that we have to wrestle with all the time. And I think that, um, you know, is one species more valuable than another one? Um, what, what I do know is that these ecological systems evolved over a very long time in some form of a balance. And uh, when we investigate, there, there are a few cases in the world that have been studied where, you know, there are natural invasions of a species. Uh, we actually studied one in Puerto Rico many years ago, Anolis, it's a, a type of a chameleon lizard. Uh, you, you know, the, an island, apparently after some storms, one species moved into the island uh, and it was an aggressive species and started running the other one out. And those are, those are tough ones, but at least that's an occurrence that we didn't cause. And I think for me, I think knowing that nature uh, worked pretty well before uh, we, we started messing with it. And in fact, it creates these wonderful ecological services that we don't even understand all of them yet. One of the things that is a high priority is, is to figure out when we are the agent that's causing the problem. And if we are, then, it, you know, in general, the, the ethical decision is to try and correct that. I don't think the answer is easy in all cases. And, you know, we, we, um, I dare to bring it up, uh, and, and it might not be a smart move, but things like the wild horses that live here, you know, that there's a big tussle over all of that. But, um, you know, the management concerns with those wild horses, and in this case, with an ant that was brought over on a, a boat, um, are pretty challenging. And if it was just one species versus another, that might be something, but the story didn't really fully go into the fact that the entire ecosystem was breaking down because of that introduction. And so the red crab was just one very visible um, thing that could respond to that and therefore be restored. So I don't have a, a direct answer to you. It's an ethical question, but I think I would, I, I favor and many conservation scientists favor the idea of it was working well we introduced something or caused it. And so we should try to restore that balance back. Got a question from Ben that sort of piggybacks off of that. Um, species have gone extinct throughout Earth's history. How can we tell the difference between natural selection extinction and human caused extinction? Yeah, that, it can be really tough. And again, it goes back to scientists studying the problem. And the first thing we did was is once once they realized there was a problem there on the island with the crabs, they went in and tried to, you know, work on the science to see what was causing the problem. Um, and, and I think, again, if, if uh, we, we can detect many times when we're the problem, I mean, if we go to something like the bison or to the Channel Island fox, we can start to figure out what the cause is and how we were uh, agents in that. But, uh, you know, Species are also just, it's many orders of magnitude of them are going extinct now uh, relative to any rates that we know about from the scientific investigations. And so I think in, in most cases under current conditions, we can figure it out that we, um, we broke it. As I see a little quote coming in there, so we got to fix it. And that's, that's kind of the, you know, if we can restore it back to where it was, if we can actually make that distinction, that's great. There are cases where we have seen a few natural extinctions from volcanic eruptions and other things, and those can't be helped. They're part of the baseline. Let's see, Ryan's got a great question here. It seems like agriculture is a major problem for resiliency and that connectivity that you were talking about before, Chris. What do you think would be a good practical step towards solving this or a good step in the right direction? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's one of our biggest challenges uh, it, when we look at the Great Plains. And then of course, we didn't even discuss things like water management and how there are many areas of the Arkansas River, for example, that run dry when they used to not do so. Um, so, so I think that um, what that mapping exercise did was com consider human element and the amount of alteration that's occurred in there. And so the mapping is showing us where the best opportunities are 
And if it's already linked, and, and for example, if you look at the, in the Canadian River that runs from just south of the Colorado line over through the panhandle of Texas, it's a pretty intact, or it's a, not intact, it's not the right word, it's a functional system that's kind of connected. The Arkansas River, on the other hand, has uh, some pretty significant challenges with it. Uh, but then if you go to the Smoky Valley streams and things, what the, what the map has shown us is where our best chances of restoration are if it's not already connected. And so I think that that then leads to, it's not just a matter of protecting, it's a matter of what kind of government programs or non-government programs or stewardship uh, tools can we use to actually create habitat that it's least more suitable for nature to be moving through it and maybe uh, ultimately having bands of restored habitat going through agricultural lands might be the best outcome we can hope for in the near term. Thanks Chris. Um, so we just have time for one more question and um, I'd like to and it, hearing a little bit about from you, what has been your favorite project working with the Nature Conservancy? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, I'm not one for that kind of a superlative very often because I have, uh, I, I really kind of feel like I've led a charmed life being able to do the kind of work that I do. Um, I'll, I'll mention a couple of them that have been uh, particularly um, striking to me. Um, when, uh, when the Nature Conservancy was approached by the landowner of the Medino Zapata Ranch, just outside of the Great Sand Dunes National Monument at that time, now a national park. The, the owner was a, a Japanese architect who lived in Manhattan and came out with a partner to actually develop golf courses and houses all over the property. Um, but the relationship developed with him after that, after he had his, I'll just call it a conversion because that's kind of what it was, um, has been pretty remarkable. He, he fell in love with the place. That's the only way I can describe it. And with the bison and everything else there. And so he kicked his partner out uh, and he offered the Nature Conservancy the opportunity at a greatly reduced price to purchase that property. And knowing that there is a species of beetle that lives there nowhere else in the world, and there are five or six other insects now known to be the same thing, and knowing that the fossil and cultural history of that area is so remarkable was really inspiring. And then I've got, I'll just briefly say this one, on the Great Plains, the J.E. Canyon Ranch is a remarkable uh, part of the Purgatory Canyon area. It's almost all private property. It can be seen on a little bit of the Forest Service lands. But seeing landowners look at that property uh, in a very different way than we did, and then finally having the opportunity to protect it, and then walking around out there at night in one of the real dark spots of the Great Plains, and seeing the bighorn sheep herd wandering around using wildlife cameras and picking up pictures of mountain lions, just it, it's, a, it's a, a system that's functioning almost. Bison and wolves and grizzly bears are, are not there, but it's about as good as it gets in the Great Plains. And that gives me hope to know that one, landowners care about it, two, that we, we can actually make deals happen that we thought we couldn't. And when you see the results and see how it has an impact on nature in front of your face and in your, in your sense of smell and everything out there, that's been one of the most inspiring things to me. And, and after retiring, I plan on continuing to do some work in the Great Plains in that same kind of way, working with landowners, uh, working with the Nature Conservancy and other land trusts to see if we can't fill those holes in that connectivity out to Oklahoma and Kansas. Thanks for that question. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Well, thank you so much for all of the work you've done throughout your career and for partnering with the museum throughout these years too. We love working with you and it was great to have you here tonight to share that history. We appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. You have my phone number and my email. It won't change. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you to our audience for joining us tonight uh, and hanging with us through some technical difficulties. And again, thank you to the Nature Conservancy for partnering with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We really appreciate your partnership and um, hope we see all of our audience here again for another virtual program. Thank you thank all. Thank you, Jess, and all of you at the museum. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.